It's like a bull one. It looks more blood. Yeah, look, look at me, not the characters behind. Even if they do strange things. All right. Well, what, what is the story of your collecting of music and if you can reference it to dance, John? Uh. I started a band in the early 1950s, it was probably the first bush band of its type in Australia, which we called the Bushwhackers. Um, and our uh, performance was mainly song, but we interspersed the songs with dances now and then. Um, s simple line dances and things like the Circassian Circle. And uh, later on we started playing um, a uh, couple dances for, for ballroom dancing as well, for sort of old time dances. And um, my early collecting was uh, chiefly to get fresh material for the bushwhackers to perform. So, did you actually come across many dances in that early collecting? Yes, we uh, we learnt the Vaso Vienna for instance, from uh, Duke Tritton's wife, who uh, showed us how they did it in the Mudgee district. Uh, the people like Joe Cashmere, an old chap that I record, an old fiddler, who came from out Burligal, and um, he, he described several dances they used to do out there in the, in the wool sheds and the village halls, uh, including um, one that's um, being performed now called the Rocking Shotties. Uh, Joe referred to this as the Bullockies shotties, and uh, because the Bullockies, uh, when they were, the series when they danced it, used to uh, put a bit of an obscene gesture into it, a lot of the MCs banned it and wouldn't allow it to be performed. How interweaved is the music that you've collected with dance and dances, or dances? Uh, well, m most of the people I've recorded from uh, have been people who played for dancers in the bush and uh, th there's a distinct difference between people who have played for dancers and people who just learnt to play dance music. Uh, you can notice this in the strict dance time, the tempo they play at. Um, and the fact that most of them will play an introduction uh, when they start playing a tune so that the dancers can get ready. Uh, and what about the place of dance in that sort of, you know, in that bush setting or a country setting? The venues, yes, that's rather interesting because, for instance, in Tasmania, most of the bush dancing was done in apple sheds. At the end of the apple season, they'd cut the apple grade around the corner somewhere, put a row of packing cases down each side of the shed and have an apple shed dance. And they were doing this right up to the, um, after the, the war. Um, when electrified guitars and grog made their appearance and ruined the apple shed dancers. They also dance in their hop drying sheds. Uh, of course, when you get up in New South Wales, they're dancing in shearing sheds. Um, Ma Seal from Kimba in South Australia played for her first dance in a wheat shed, which had an earthen floor which broke up early in the dance and smothered her in clouds of dust. Um, talking to Aborigines, out at Burke recently and they used to dance on the clay pans because it was a nice smooth flat surface free of bindies and um, this was sort of um, 20th century style dancing, uh, white men's dances but with an accordion but just all sitting around the edge of a clay pan. So there's all sorts of interesting venues for dancing. How important do you reckon the dances were as part of the sort of social structure of the little towns and villages? I think the rural dancing was very important because it provided a, uh, an occasion when people could get together and uh, meet socially. Um, transport was much slower in those days with horses and sulkies or people riding horses in and uh, f farms that might be four or five, ten miles apart. Uh, those people would never get a chance to meet their neighbours, never talk to them. Uh, unless they met them at a dance. And what about your early day in terms of um, your early childhood? Or my, my dad played the button accordion. He had an old Maison accordion. And um, he used to go away droving a lot. And, uh, but 
when you come home from these driving trips, we, we'd uh, get tunes. Uh, on the accordion, he also played mouth organ. And um, what we thought was really clever um, was when he'd, um, he'd play the uh, mouth organ and, and rattle bones at the same time and things like that. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so, so da Dad used to play an old Meson accordion. I remember it had been knocked about a bit on his driving trips. It was patched up with bits of old rag stuck on with bottle gum. Uh, it had a piece of green hide for the left hand strap and the tongue out of a boot for the thumb strap. Uh, but in the evenings he'd sit out in the back veranda uh, on the doorstep and he'd play some of these lovely old waltz tunes, things like Jack's waltz and so on. He also played mouth organ and uh, could also play the bones. And we still have to hear him play the mouth organ and the bones together. It's got to change tapes, I'm just running out. My father died when I was like, only eight years old and uh, we still had his accordion, of course, and uh, it was knocking around the house, nice to get it out and play with it occasionally. And, um, when I was about 14, my mother said, if, if you learn to play that accordion properly, uh, I'll buy you a new one. I said, the old one had leaky billows and all. And uh, so I set to work, and after a few weeks, I'd mastered Swanee River, I think it was. And uh, so I got a new Melbourne accordion. And, uh, but I, I really learned to play on my father's old broken down meson. Some sort of relationship to, to dance. Any stories there? Yes, well, um, Sally Sloan was one of the uh, people I recorded very early in my uh, collecting career. And Sally also played a Meson accordion. Meson accordions are special because they have an unusual tuning and uh, they have a strange haunting quality in that tone. And uh, one of the first things that Sally played was one of my dad's old waltz tunes, and uh, one I'd never known the name of previously, which he called Jack's Waltz, having learned from a fellow named Jack. Um, Sa Sally introduced us to things like the, the stockyards. She played a tune from the stockyards and described that as being the last figure of the quadrille, but which they used to just dance um, as a dance in its own right sometimes. Joe Cashmere was an old uh, shearer from Bootlegal. Um, he, he played for dancers and um, he told us quite a lot of stories about the dances they did in their wool sheds and so on. Um, Joe had a particularly interesting story to tell because he played a very unusual Vasa Vienna tune and uh, he played this at a uh, dance in the wool shed one night. He said the shed had cut out and they had a bottle of whiskey down every shoot and had a great old time. And about 40 years later, he'd uh, bought himself a team and he's coming to Sydney with his wagon and team. And a policeman stopped him and was questioning him. And he said, uh, the policeman said, I think I've met you before somewhere. And Dad said, well, it couldn't have been long by. I've never been in there. And the policeman said, Weren't you out at Burlingall at the Woolshed dance there you know, 40 years ago when such and such a shed cut out? I said, yeah, and he said, remember you playing that Vars of Vienna tune? And it was 40 years later, this policeman still remembered Joe Boy's Vars of Vienna tune. <laughs> Any other dance stories? Or people you collected? Uh, it's a fellow named Billy Gilbert. Um, he came from down the south coast originally, a sleeper cutter in his young days. And um, he told several good stories. One was a, a bush hall or a church hall where they used to ride in from all over the countryside for Sunday morning for the church service. And after the service was over, they'd all hang around talking about their, their wheat and their crops and things, or the parson had driven away. Then they'd get back and open up the church and get in and have a dance there. And um, there was a, one of those treadle organs, a, a reed organ, 
And uh, Joe's dad used to play the music and uh, he could play good waltzes on the piano but with the treadle organ he couldn't relate the, the treadling of his feet to the three, four time. And so uh, his young daughter used to have to get down on her knees beside him and operate the, the, the pedals <laughs> for, the, for the air <laughs> with her hands while, while he played waltz tunes. <laughs> And that was a good example of not, them not having a venue and uh, not having the time probably to come into a dance on Saturday night or during a weeknight, but using their Sunday for first floor for church and then for having a dance. What thoughts have you got about the you know, enthusiasm now for a lot of people who are actually collecting um, dances and music that probably are closer to a real tradition as opposed to the... Uh, Stuff. I'm sorry, I don't uh, get the. Well, there, there, there is a, there is obviously an, an enthusiasm now for the kind of music that you've been collecting, and the, the dances with, for instance, like a group like Olga Willing. Yes. What's the observa any observations you'd make about that, or any thoughts? Uh, well. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I still don't relate to the question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I suppose that there, there does seem to be some sort of... Is there a growing enthusiasm now for some of the more um, original forms, uh, more, more interest in the dances that have been collected and closer to the way that they were danced? Yes, the, the, there is more interest these days, I suppose, in... Uh, dancing, uh, doing the old traditional dances in the traditional style. Um, one of the problems in the past has been um, having collected and recorded the dance music, it was to get it out to people um, in the revival, the folk revival scene, uh, so they could play it. And um, you, you could publish them in book form with printed music, but of course uh, a lot of people can't read music and so they didn't learn the tunes. Uh, and it's much easier for a person to learn a tune orally. And it's in recent years, probably since the uh, cassette rig um, quarter came on the market, that people are able to um, uh, get the music on tape and listen to it, learn it orally. And also, it's just so simple these days to run off a copy on a cassette so people can pass the tune on that way probably learn the tunes more uh, thoroughly and uh, more accurately than learning them at a dance where they'd hear the tune played once and take it home in their head and by the time they got round to playing it it would have changed considerably. Well now uh, they're able to listen to it on tape three or four times and correct any mistakes. So possibly uh, music's been passed along orally uh, much more correctly than in the past. And what about your own discovering of uh Tape recording as a method of, of collecting. Yes, my, my introduction to the tape recorder was when I um, found an old shearer who uh, had a song called The Back Block Shearer, which is probably better known as Wijigawira Joe. And uh, I went along with Chris Kempster to take down his song. We spent a whole Saturday afternoon, and I got the words down, four verses and choruses, I think, and Chris got two lines of music out of <laughs> this three or four hours' work. And I went home saying that it was going to take us weeks to get the uh, old chap song down, and a neighbour just bought a tape recorder, which in the early 1950s had just come on the consumer market. Um, so he suggested I borrow that for the next week and go and record the man. So we, we recorded this entire repertoire in the space of two or three hours the following Saturday afternoon. And um, I was so enthralled with the magical tape recorder that I just straight away went out and pawned my camera to get the deposit and invested in a tape recorder. How many hours of tape do you reckon you've uh, put through on a machine like that since then? Oh, many, many hours. I, I, I don't keep a record of the uh, playing time, but I have collected something like 8,000 items of songs and tunes and stories over the last 40 odd years. Are there particular favourites that stand out out of that, those 8,000? There are particular tunes, yes. Um, Joe Cashmere had a lovely uh, old waltz tune which he called the Orphan Boy Waltz. And um, 
particularly pretty one, and uh, I've learned it, and I get a lot of requests to play that one in particular. Sally Sloan, of course, she played the tune that my dad used to play, which he called Jack's Waltz, and that's become a favourite in my own repertoire, an old-time waltz tune. Uh, Joe Cashmere is Varso Vienna, of course. It's so distinctly different to all other Varso Viennas. It's one of my favourites. And every now and then you, you come across one of these outstanding tunes that sticks in your memory. How much material do you reckon is still out there to be collected? Lots and lots. Early in the piece, back in the 1950s, I used to think, these people are getting old, nobody's learning their tunes, they'll die and it'll all be lost. And I was racing around frantically trying to record them all. And as time went on, I found that these people did have children who had learnt to play or sing. And um, so it's amazing that there's just as much material turning up today and still as much to be collected as there was back in the 1950s. Hmm. Good question. Well, that's Yes, uh, one interesting discovery recently was uh, somebody introduced us to an old man living at Kutamunda um, I said he was an excellent mouth organ player and played a lot of old time dance tunes. This was Bert Jamison and uh, accompanied by Rob Willis uh, made three or four trips to record Bert. Uh, we made a Super 8 film of him and uh, recently um, Wonka Willie had the bright idea of uh, re recording Bert and, and joining in and accompanying him, making him more or less a, a member of their band and brought out this excellent cassette which was a you know, masterpiece of uh, putting together separate recordings. But wh what that has done is made Bert Jamison's dance tunes, which he played in the Jamison family band, has made them available to uh, dance dancers and dance musicians today. This is an old waltz tune my dad used to play on his medicine accordion. But I never really knew the name until I began collecting and Sally Sloan played it for me and as soon as she played it that came to the memory of my father sitting on the doorstep playing the same waltz tune which Sally called Jack's Waltz because she learned it from a man named Jack. Uh -huh. <laughs>